Welcome back to our introduction to the subject of networks and distributed systems. More or less an overview of what we're going to be studying in this course. Now let's pick up where we left off last. One can simply consider the word protocol to mean a set of rules. If we think about it, our daily life is permeated by rules and protocols by which we communicate with one another. For example, in elementary school, the young child learns that in order to ask a question or make a statement, he or she must first raise a hand in order to be recognized by the teacher. Some children learn a protocol that requires that he or she respond to an adult with yes ma'am or no sir. We've all heard of diplomatic protocols that might be observed at the UN. It's very important for effective international cooperation that diplomats and their staff learn those protocols. A network protocol is like a human protocol except that the entities exchanging messages and taking actions are hardware or software components of some device. All activity in the Internet that involves two or more communicating remote entities is governed by one or more protocols. For example, hardware implemented protocols in two physically connected computers control the flow of bits on the wire between the two network interface cards. Congestion control protocols in those end systems we talked about earlier control the rate at which packets are transmitted between the sender and the receiver. Protocols and routers determine a packet's path from the source to the destination. Protocols are running everywhere on the Internet and consequently much of this course is about computer network protocols. One computer protocol that you may know is used when you make a request to a web server. When you type the address of a web page into your web browser, the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, referred to as HTTP, allows you to retrieve the information you need. A protocol defines the format and the order of messages exchanged between two or more communicating entities, as well as the actions taken on the transmission and or receipt of a message or some other event. The Internet and computer networks in general make extensive use of protocols. Different protocols are used to accomplish different communication tasks. Now let's start at the edge of the network and look at the components with which we are most familiar, mainly the computers, the smartphones, and other devices that we use on a daily basis. The computers and the other devices connected to the Internet are often referred to as end systems because they're at each end of the communication. You'll also hear them referred to as hosts because they host application programs such as a web browser or a web server program, an email client program, or an email server program. Hosts are sometimes further divided into two categories, clients and servers, several of which we've just now heard me describe to you, email clients and email servers. Informally, clients tend to be a desktop or a mobile computer or a smartphone and so on, whereas the servers tend to be more powerful machines that store and distribute web pages, stream video, relay email, and so on. Today, most of the servers from which we receive search results, email, web pages, and videos reside in large data centers. For example, Google has 30 to 50 data centers 
with many having more than 100,000 servers. Goodness. In developed countries today, more than 65% of the households have internet access, with Korea, Netherlands, Finland, and Sweden leading the way with more than 80% of the households having internet access, almost all via high-speed broadband connection. Finland and Spain have recently declared high-speed internet access a legal right. Given this intense interest in home access, let's begin our overview of access networks by considering how homes connect to the internet. Having considered the applications and the end systems at what we're referring to as the edge of the network, let's next consider the access network. The access network is the network that physically connects an end system to the very first router, also known as the edge router, on a path from the end system to any other distant end system. If you, if you have a computer lab at your school, it would be considered at least a part of an access network. And that router that is connecting the school's collection of networks, network of networks, that router is the first link to the internet. Two of the most prevalent types of broadband residential access are referred to as digital subscriber lines, DSL, and cable. A resident typically obtains a DSL, internet access from the same local telephone company that provides the wired or local phone access. So when a DSL is used, a customer's telephone company is also its ISP. Often, each customer's DSL modem uses the existing telephone line, which is a twisted pair copper wire, to exchange the data with the digital subscriber line access multiplexer, which is located in the telephone company's local central office. Now, many of our local phone companies are gradually changing that line over to a fiber optic line, which is increasing their capacity and their speed. A multiplexer like the one I just talked about, the Digital Subscriber Line Access Multiplexer. A multiplexer is a device that selects one of several analog or digital input signals and forwards the selected input into a single line. Multiplexers are mainly used to increase the amount of data that can be sent over the network within a certain amount of time and bandwidth. The home's DSL modem takes digital data and translates it to, a, to high frequency tones for transmission over telephone wires of the, to the central office. The analog signals from many such houses are translated back to a digital format at the DSL AM. The residential telephone line carries both data and traditional telephone signals simultaneously, which are encoded at different frequencies. The DSL standards define different transmission rates for downstream and upstream. Because the downstream and the upstream rates are different, the access is said to be asymmetric. The DSL provider may purposely limit a residential rate when tiered service, that is, different rates, available at different prices are offered. There may also be differences because the maximum rate can be limited by the distance between the home and the central office, the gauge of the twisted pair line, and the degree of electrical interference. If the residence is not located within 5 to 10 miles of the central office, the residence must resort to an alternative form of internet access. While DSL makes use of the telephone company's existing telephone infrastructure and cable internet access makes use of cable television's existing cable television structure, a resident obtains cable internet access from the same company that provides its cable television.
Because both fiber and coaxial cable are employed in this system, it is often referred to as a hybrid fiber coax. Cable internet access requires special modems called cable modems. As with DSL modem, the cable modem is typically an external device and connects the home PC through an Ethernet port. We'll talk about Ethernet later. One important characteristic of cable internet access is that it is a shared broadcast medium. Every packet sent by the head end travels downstream on every link to every home. And every packet sent by a home travels on the upstream channel to the head end. What this means is that one's performance may vary upon how many homes are online at any given time. That shared medium also means that a distributed multiple access protocol is required. Well, that's enough for this session. Go ahead and look over your notes. Do whatever you want to do. When you're ready, come on back and we'll go to the third lesson.